the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. Well, this is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everybody, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont, on behalf of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea eruption update live uh, today, uh, April 20th, 2021. I'm showing you guys a picture from a video here from about a week ago on a screen of this very slow uh, outlet of lava that we'll talk about here shortly. But uh, we will be uh, talking about the last week here in Kilauea, as well as a little bit of the whole last four months, um, some little snippets here and there of how, how it's been to put things in context, what's happened recently into what's happened early on and throughout the whole eruption here. Uh, Dan will be collecting questions and manning our streams, uh, making sure let us know if you have any issues with the streams. Uh, have any questions, we'll, we'll take, take a, a question break in the middle and one at the end as well. And uh, we'll bring you guys uh, as comprehensive, uh, but hopefully not joining on too long here with the update. They, uh... So starting off, uh, this is the USGS video released uh, just recently of uh, the, the entry point, the inlet beneath that west vent complex. Lava is still coming out of, out of, the, out of the west vent fissure uh, underneath that built up spatter cone that's off to the uh, top and the left here. I'd see it off the screen in this direction here. We'll see it shortly in some of the next sequences. But it's coming out through the through the crusted over pathway, seemingly one here and probably one that's more this way as well. A wide coming out through a wide area here. And across this whole front surface, it's been 
very slowly, very sluggishly oozing out. That's what the USGS had to say is the lava lake is supplied via an inlet in the west margin. I might have to play it here too. Uh, was covered in a thin, flexible crust and was moving at a very slow velocity. That's what they said here. Start playing for you guys. This is that 10 times version. So you can see what is actually faster than the real movement here. Once again, this is US just video. This is their original, original video. You can see a big piece of that crusted over margin detaches there and is rafted away. But this is at 10 times speed. And so the vents remain submerged there, um, crusted over for the most part. We saw some breakouts in this area last week, but nothing more recent than that. There have been breakouts near the cone, but that's been farther over on the backside of the crater. We'll look at that here shortly. In the meantime, I wanted to show you guys this footage at actual speed. So here's the actual speed about how fast the lava is oozing out of there. You're sitting there watching it. And so that's that's one reason that there's not a, a very rapid pace of change on the volcano here. See that? Um, so last week, overflows over here, this upper part of the crusted over pathway. And then this week, overflows are farther over on the backside of the cone. So we'll turn to the F1 camera here. This is the F1 camera just for a section of the last week here. And this is the main west vent cone over here with that first pathway coming in over there. The second one probably coming something like this. Hard to tell exactly. But that's the, the previous path of lava, as we'll see here shortly. And so we're going to look at pulses where whether it's gas that's coming out of this upper part of the vent or a big slug of magma that's coming out because what's been going on for the last week has been a, a triple deflation inflation we'll talk about shortly as well. So the pressure has been overall dropping, but perhaps you have some slugs of gas that are pushing up some of these uh, pulses of small batches of magma coming up here. Let me play this for you guys. Focus over here and these small flows coming out and now they're coming towards the crater wall. And crusting over in this upper section, but still feeding flows to the flow margins and actually pulsing where that one phase will peter out and then you have another one, another one, and another smaller one there. And and recently it hasn't been a whole lot of change from that. Look at what recent time. We've essentially had less of that pulsing and similar to this gas venting. Here's a wider angle view, angle view. So we were looking at that inset right in there. And now we can see the whole lava lake active surface circulating and the small islets in there. A little bit less circulation in the little bay over here as usual. All that within the context of this larger crusted over eastern section of the lava lake there. So I'm going to pause it and go back here. I was like, I'm back here. Um, there's also in this section what you can probably see now. Better than last week is we more convincingly have a double pathway here where it seems like there are times when you see a double V pattern here. There are two different outlet points at times here. Keep an eye on that there. And lava is still flowing underneath all this crust and oozing up along the margins all around here and here. It hasn't happened as much as last week, perhaps because of the, the deflation inflation. Um, but looking at the whole history of that west vent here, here's that original burst of that northeast cone, that original pathway that starts pouring in, eventually crusts over. Uh, we eventually build a larger perched pond up here. It's coming. And it drains out there. And this is the ooze ups happened last week where it oozed up off the crater wall, cracked the rim of the perch pond, and caused a little draining event right in there. So that's the context of what's happening here is that pressure is still coming in and pulses, and some pulses are going into the lake. Some are breaking that front side entry, uh, entry point. And this is all happening in sync. So breaking out from that entry point and popping up the side was what was happening last week. And now we're just seeing it popping open on the backside over here. 
This is still last week here. One more view on the front. Let's see a little bit better. Where did that photograph was in that video we just saw here? How this entry point migrates from being straight across, jumping up here, times, and zipping itself back up where it resumes that original shape. All right, that's the time lapses just for the past week here. And fast forwarding here to the, the current last 24 hour time lapse from the USGS on their fantastic website there. You can see not a whole lot of action from that West Vent complex. You do see some of that cooling flow. You see that same circulation and not a whole lot of change otherwise on the margin here. We will continue our rounds through the webcams. This is the KW cam. And that same view is that thermal camera we just saw with the visible day and night last 24 hours automatic. I'll zoom it in a little bit. You guys can get a better view in there. Not a whole lot of change in the last 24 hours. But to wrap it up, here's the S1 camera. If you're looking from south to north, we can see that inlet area a little bit better right in there. I'll zoom it in as much as we can here. And seems pretty stable coming out of perhaps there and there or along that margin. Okay, most recent photograph of that area is a lot, a lot higher resolution than that webcam. So we'll go forward here and show you guys April 13th. Similar kind of view, the crested over edge of the of the lava entry entry point, exit point from the vent and entry point into the lake. Here's the remains of that tilted love island. It's strata striped going that way still, right in there. Hand it over a little bit. And zoom it back out. And those islets are actually fairly big. So lava lake area is about eight acres is still a big area. Quite a big area for sure. So that was the 14th, I'm sorry, the 13th. And going ahead to the 16th here, it's a different, a little bit different perspective. Taking from the east, we'll pick up on that storyline here um, after a first question break. But to zoom in on it here, if you take it from the east side, and there really is a, a lower angle view, so you can see a much better profile of this levee, this pile of of lava rubble that's likely welded and fused with liquid cooled lava as well. Um, whatever whatever uh, is making up this firm, this levee that's that looks like a few meters above ground, right? And holding the upper liquid surface elevated in there. Better view of that. Interesting how the lava dives underneath this thing and under the lake flowing. Interesting angle there. Looking over the top of this big island, with steam vents here in the foreground, and also quite a bit of gas vents here at the backside along this. This is going to be the southwest wall, west southwest wall over here. Um, vents here out in the 13th, back to the 13th, and another photograph view of that similar sequence as we just saw here. And you can see the USGS here. Where we're getting the, the quote that the lava stream was covered in a thin flexible crust and was moving at a very slow velocity. So a very sluggish, very low velocity. We're having to speed it up to see coming out. That's the story as it as it stands now, four months into the eruption. As much decreased output continues, but still continuous, hasn't stopped coming out. Okay, April 14th, there's a West Vent Complex. And uh, that bay that seems to have slightly less circulation, but is still hot in the thermal images and is still showing uh, the foundering crystal overturning process happening within it. And one more view here from the east and showing us the whole, whole crater. So the active lava surface that we saw earlier on with that perched rim was right in there. And now we're seeing the majority of this and from this perspective, from the east, front side of the view here is all crusted over. This is most of the area of eruption in the last four months that the lava does not have access to the surface. 
But you do see, probably way worth zooming in on here, zoom in on this to this right margin right in here, because you see the texture is a little different. It's a little smoother, a little flatter, slightly, slightly different color. And this is likely that younger lava that's squeezing up. It's an interesting texture to see it there. Now we have it zoomed in a little closer. But you have that older crust of the lava, and this is one of these ooze up flows that's occurring between that original crust of the lava lake and the crater wall. As this whole crust is lifted, buoyed from below by the lava going underneath it, it will lift up and creates that gap, and lava comes up here in that gap, right up the side through there. So there it is, right in there. View there. Okay, look at our our signals here on a volcano. Uh, we are coming out here. If we look at the past week, we had one deflation, inflation, second deflation, inflation, and now we're currently in deflation again. So we'll see. It's a net drop from positive two to negative two, just about for micro radians. Not a very large drop here in our ground tilt over the past week. And yes, yes, has described this pattern of deflation inflation events before is the background character of the volcano. We don't really link that to any future activity, but it's interesting to see it. Uh, what it does often uh, influence the, the volcano is in the fact that the lava levels will drop uh, if we have deflation for long enough. That's something that we have seen happen in the last, the last few days here. The lava level has dropped back down from its crest, uh, back down one meter, back down three feet. So that's the past week. And looking at the past month, so we were just zoomed into this little area right in here for the last week. There's our most recent deflation. One, two, three. And it's following behind other larger ones, like the one we had a couple weeks ago. That was in total similar you know, as the three we have together here. Interesting to see what's going on. And, we have enough of these in a row that we might have more cresting over lava surface or more rearrangements around the vent um, or lowering of lava levels as we imagine that the gas is, is vented from the lava and that leads to a lowering of lava, lava surface even as lava is still continually being added without interruption into that lake. Okay, that's the past month. And looking at the GPS here, we can see still continued extension at a much slower rate than we had for the first three months of the eruption here. Really the last month has been still extending but quite a bit less. Zoom it in for a better view. In here. There's the first three months. Well, actually this is the first three months. And the last month right in here. Okay. So here is the depth of lava for the past week and our scale in meters here on the left is 0.2 meters per hash mark so 225.4 226 is here and 227 will be right up here we got close to 227 got essentially to 226.7 right in there at, the, at its crest uh, on the 15th but since we've had deflation inflation for a lot of the last week we've seen a corresponding drop off in that lava level I'm looking at essentially the peaks here. We do have various levels of variation occurring on top of here, whether it's related to gas pissing or the vent breaking, out, breaking and um, enlarging, and that kind of thing. The overall patterns we're looking at um, have previously been rising and looking pretty close, only happening for about a week or so, but it seems to be dropping along with the deflation inflation. We zoom out for the last month. That's our plateau right over here on the right. For that a longer drawn out increase there. Um, really within the last month the lava lake has come up nine feet three meters. The month before that it was a little bit more 14 feet five meters still not much both of those. The second month was you know it was actually 55 meters so uh, I'm sorry 55 feet 16 meters so that's more than both of the last two months combined but really all the action happened in that first week and that first month it filled in 663 feet, 202 meters just in that first month. Ever since then, it's been, been increasing much more slowly as it fills the upper part of the ice cream cone, right? And it's coming out at a reduced rate as well. For the whole eruption here, 
depth of lava early on, shown in green when it was measured manually, rising rapidly in that first week, and then a little less rapidly that next month, really flattening out more and more and more, where here we are at the right end of it in April, four months on, and looking like we're at some kind of a plateau for now. We'll see what happens next. Okay. The output we often link to the SO2 emissions. Most recently, they were measured on a 16th at 950 tons per day. That's not drawn on this graph, but it fits somewhere right in there. And that's within that pattern over the last couple months, that within an average of about 800 to 1200, you know, a few occasional lower values from time to time that we haven't seen sustained. So there are early hints that maybe things were, were waning a little bit, a little bit more and then they jump back up again. So it's, there's some cycle happening here and we can't look at just the low values or just the high values or just the middle values. That's the, the, the range of it more or less is what's interesting. So in the past month, the range hasn't really changed. And for the whole eruption here, it really hasn't changed a whole lot since that first couple of months when we, we topped off at 50,000 tons per day in that second day of eruption. And that's the maximum that first month. Whereas a maximum, maximum that second month, right through here, was about 2,200 tons per day. The maximum this following month, and there, that was about 1,100 tons per day. And the last month, this fourth month, 1,200 tons per day, slightly up, uh, but really practically the same the last two months. Um, fairly steady, essentially, there at this backside. So this is our proxy for lava output. So it really was coming out fast at the beginning and not as much. And then really it's been, been on a long gradual decline for a while now. Okay, so uh, gas is still coming out. There's this USGS video released uh, from the uh, flanks of Mauna Loa looking back at Kilauea. It's showing some typical weather and a plume. We're looking from north to south here and we'll see uh, come in. There, start off in the dark, the glowing crater of Hale Ma'u Ma'u, the Southern Cross, perhaps, that I've come across. Here's our sunrise, and now we see our gas plume. Let's zoom it in a bit for you guys here. See our gas plume blowing across the Kau Desert there. Coming out, but when the weather comes in, it totally. Uh, obscures it and swamps it and dwarfs it by the volume of what's coming out as well. There it is back in that again. USGS, USGS, time-lapse animation there from the Mount Lowell camp. Okay, and so just to make sure that we show you guys this in a, in a text source here, this is the USGS webpage, Kilauea Volcano Update, Tuesday, April 20th, and our Depth today, 226 meters, 741 feet deep, 950 tons per day, measured on April 14th. Correct date right there. And otherwise, no unusual activity, no, no, not a whole lot of change, no, not a whole lot to report. Submerged inlets, written foundering. Sporadic lava oozing out around the perimeter. Same, same thing as we've, as we've been summarizing for you guys. That's the source right there. So to finish it off with the earthquakes here, earthquakes on Kilauea uh, have been a few more happening at the summit, well, mostly because there were no, not a whole lot happening at the summit at all recently. Um, so the appearance of some makes it look like a, like a big jump, but it's a small jump. Um, it's back to still below background levels, but now there actually is a little bit of, of activity at the summit. So it's interesting to note that that's happening there. Um, if we look the rates for the past year here, you can see that building up to the eruption all through early 2020, um, ramping up with that intrusion, and then the eruption begins right in here. And the earthquake rates have been down quite a bit. So maybe a slight increase here at the very tail end, but only in a relative scale of that much. And only in a relative scale of that much right there compared to this. This is elevated up in here. And this is a drop for the eruption. So this is all still below background right through here. That line corresponding to 200 earthquakes per week. So 
the will of that. And I wanted to note, last thing before I take our first question break here and say our first mahalos, uh, Volcano Watch this week is issued by the USGS, written by the USGS, focus, focuses on the Southwest Rift Zone uh, this week. So check that out. It's posted on hawaiitracker.com. You guys can look through and read more about the Southwest Rift Zone, which we will come back to around at some future point in time. When it's, uh, when, when it's a specialized topic, and we cover, cover with more than just one one one-off article. So, all right, Dane. Uh, that's our the first part of our right. update. We'll come back a little, little, little yeah, bit later, good. and we'll we'll add some more of the four month context. All right. Well, we got to get through some. Uh, our, we have some sponsors that we'd like to thank, and we have some uh, people that have been supporting us on whitetracker.com. If you would like to support us, best way you can do that is to just share this video. That helps us uh, get more exposure. It really helps the channel grow. Second way is to become a member on hawaiitracker.com. It's a social media site with a community-based uh, organization trying to promote uh, you know, awareness of disasters, among other things. It's a non-political social media site, so in case you're kind of tired of that, the, we've kind of a safe haven over there. Uh, third thing you can do is maybe consider a monetary donation. We take those on hawaiitracker.com slash support. With that, I want to thank the donors for today. Uh, which is Michelle B, Judy P, Les H, and Laura B. Really appreciate it. Every one wow, of you. you guys. Keeps us going. And we do want to thank also, we have two companies that have been helping us out. Uh, first one is Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa. Uh, a really nice restaurant, affordable, but really uh, interesting and delicious takes on some local classics and some uh, specials that rotate that just incredible like their ribeye is amazing there um I, the burgers are great everything's uh you know some really good stuff the fish and chips when it's mahi mahi is a must try but yeah the Kaleo's bar and grill in poa check them out if you're ever around uh town second one is uh kalani tours it, they do uh specialize in volcano waterfall and coffee tours and they do a little mix. Uh, it's different from your normal tour companies where it's giant bus and a bunch of people. This is more small, uh, small tailored uh, tours with more educational uh, aspects to them. Really good guys. We appreciate them being our sponsors. All right. With that, let's get into some of the questions we got here for today. Got some interesting ones. Um, let me get them pulled up. So let's start with a question off of Facebook. Chris asks, is there an estimated effusion rate based upon the lake volume and changes uh, during the eruption? Uh, yes, uh, we've, we've calculated one and I'll show it here in this next section, um, uh, but it's been pretty low. It's somewhere in a range of one cubic meter per second at the moment or less than that, maybe even half cubic meter per second. We'll explain how I get that from the USGS maps and all that data a little later on. Yeah, and then quite a bit. So it's a lot, a lot less uh, dynamic than it used to be early on. One of the things I was just thinking of uh, before we continue on was that we're now at the four month part, uh, you know, four month break in this eruption, and we're past the 2018 eruption by considerable amount at this point. And yeah, it right. does not feel like it at all. Yeah. Like the, 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 I guess the stress really makes a difference on that whole thing. Um, and yeah, how yeah. long it feels. Yeah, time. But, yeah, it's instead of volume, we haven't cut up anywhere near to the same amount of volume. That's for sure. Oh, right, right. So, and also, it... Nathan, Nathan was pointing out that uh, the four months from the the four months that this has lasted, if you compare it to Pu'u'u'u, it's uh, more than a hundred times shorter. Still, so yeah. it's just interesting the 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 contrast between the eruptions that we've had in our lifetimes and before our lifetimes even too. More yeah, but that, that's, that's an interesting point right there because because Puo'o did sustain, I think on average, I think in the long term, it might have been somewhere around four cubic meters per second, right? That's what it sustained for the long term. Mm -hmm. It might have varied between, I forget now, maybe two and six, somewhere in that range. I'll have to, have to look that up. That sounds about uh, right. But but I don't remember it, it sustaining at one or less than one 
where I believe our eruption is now. And of course, the calculations are very rough because we don't have all the, the fine data. We only have the occasional snapshot SGS uh, publishes. Right. But that's that's about where I think we are. Well, this question is a little bit different in that this is one I'm going to throw in there. Um, so looking at the DI cycles and that recent iteration of DIs that we've been seeing with the lower peaks and the uh, more compressed frequency on them, We've talked about it before how DI cycles are somewhat indicative of uh, lack of activity, for a better word, uh, just where things aren't uh, ramping up. But could this could this uh, change in the DIs be what a final breath in this eruption looks like? I'm, I keep wondering how much lower volume can it go before it shuts off? And I keep getting surprised on it almost. Yes, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I, th I think that the first thing to note is that we, we were looking based on the, uh, I believe it was Anderson paper, Anderson et al. paper about the tote cycle, is that during pool era, it seemed like there were less deflation inflation events prior to some change in the activity. But when this eruption mm -hmm. began, even back in December, we were having deflation inflation events all the time. And the eruption that didn't, in this case, really prove true. So it didn't really show it, right. show us that it were leading to any kind of, you know, lack of eruption. Anything. You know, it, it really was really, essentially background. It didn't tell us anything about anything. It turns out, in hindsight, apart from that, there's true. magma in that shallow chamber down there, and it's doing something to cause that that DI signal. And so that's mm. still happening now. And it's connected in some way enough that the, the lava lake is is feeling it for sure, right? The vent is feeling it, um, but it's hard hard to know. And really, yeah. I mean, I think the the interesting thing is, you know, we we did see at Pu'o times when we had long lasting deflation inflation events um, that sometimes would last three or five days from the summit, right? Um, back in the Pu'o era, big deflation inflation mm. events. And then the, the vent would clog all the way up. It would harden up, and then the, you know, the pressure would come back, and you break open a new version, like a new crack or a new nozzle, or it's out the other side of the cone, or something funny could happen whenever that that kind of thing occurred. Mm -hmm. So even if we aren't necessarily leading to an end, it might it might it seems like something is changing, right? We are seeing those earthquakes as well are interesting. It's not not alarming or anything, but the fact that there were no earthquakes, and now we're starting to see some earthquakes in that summit area again is you know just noteworthy and we'll have to just wait and see what it actually means in the long term right. yeah so i don't know i don't know if it's actually ending or not or if it's going to shift gears and you know um, pop out somewhere else or if it can just turn off and be done and you know and as soon as it's done it's going to start spreading and swelling or continue spreading and swelling like it is now and we'll just be mm -hmm. left to wonder how long until it just breaks open again whether it's a matter right. of hours or days or weeks or months and every time every minute goes by, we'll wonder what's changing now. So it's still very dynamic and unpredictable, bottom line. Right. So Lady on YouTube asks um, about the lava lake as well. Uh, what causes the lava to push up in that particular area? Um, is, is it the thin crust or what kind of creates the, the what is the variable that um, prioritizes it first inside the pit? Yeah, you know, Mau Mau, but also the particular vent location, maybe. It's got to do with the the the, the cracks that are already there. The lava can be used to to work its way through, and so the cracks that are there now there's a huge amount of them, and most of them moved a lot during that 2018 collapse to accompany that evacuation of magma toward the lower east rift to feed that eruption. All that volume we were referring to just a little while ago. So. The, that innermost pit has the has a crack that allowed that inner part to drop in, and the lava likes to come out along those vertical cracks, and, and it's, that's the way where, it, where it's the pressure releases the easiest pathway out is is to find one of those areas in the crater walls and then and break out on those cracks. So that particular area was one of the original cracks from four months ago. There was another one further to the, the north that only lasted about a week in the end. And it's now, you know, it, it put out more of the of the lava in that first week, probably. 
or you know a good amount of it maybe not maybe not maybe not in volume total by now right um, mm -hmm. but that first week from the north vent was substantial and then we switched over to the west vent and because that north vent was a little bit lower elevation and it was buried and covered over and it stopped flowing because of that potentially or at the same time as that happened right, right. at the same time all right we have one more here uh Eric asks, do you, do you think if there was a sudden increase in lava output enough to cover the entire eastern crust, we would see something similar to the features from the 1921 photos? I think so. I think, I think so. I think that'd be, that would be what could happen. That'd be example. how you get yeah. it. Yeah, something like that. Or, you know, imagine if, if, if we have enough deflation inflation and let's say that you shut off the north vent somehow. I'm sorry, the west vent, and you reactivate the north vent, and you can put lava up underneath that crust directly without having it come up and over and pour right. in, right? And one difference of that is that then even what little gas you have, you're not just automatically venting it all away from the very beginning. You can actually percolate it through the lava lake, and mobilize more of the whole thing, and start messing with underneath of it that way. Yeah, and it certainly could flow out around the edges and pop up and have that ring flow for sure, for sure, yeah. I think we're getting there. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure how many iterations of it it'll take, right? You know, um, I think that's the process in the long term, but it might be that it takes 10 years of it trying to do that, that it actually can attain that, that geometry and configuration. Right? Or something mm -hmm. else happens before that. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and great, Last great question for this. Yeah, that is a good question. I like that one. Uh, this is going to be an aggregated question um, from Chris and Victoria, both asking about very similar things. Uh, so the lava level in the lake occasionally drops. Is it draining somewhere or contracting due to cooling? Or what's kind of the story on the the lava levels uh, variation? Well, the variations are, f are fairly small. They are, you know, whenever the deflation inflation cycles happen, a lot in a row like we have now it doesn't seem to drop more than maybe two meters something like that and that only matters because we're, we're our output now is so slow that we're only you know we're essentially only gaining one meter a week so if we drop one meter we've you know we've actually undone two weeks of work right there mm. and we catch back up right so that's the, we're just going so slow now that it's more noticeable and it seems like it's a you know but overall that one meter drop is the typical amount that we that we that we have seen which is not um, does not require there to be a hole at the bottom for the lava to drain out. I mean, there could be some draining happening. We just don't know. We can't see down there. I don't know. What, you know what's going on in the north vent, those lower west vent fissures as well. We just, we just don't know what's happening. What's been happening down there the entire time? Maybe there is a slow drain, um, but mm. it's not necessary to explain because you do lose lose gas, especially there is cooling, but much more so you lose the gas bubbling out of the lava and that's what allows it to to contract and lose volume more so than the cooling. All right. Well, that does it for this segment. We will be doing one more question and answer segment at the end. If you have any comments or questions, just drop them in the chat and we'll get to them. All right. Mahalo, day. Mahalo for the question, you guys. Mahalo to our sponsors and our donors. Thanks, everybody. I'm back to it. All right, so we're going to start the second segment today by looking at a couple more of these photographs released by the USGS. And this one here is released um, just recently and showing April 16th, uh, an excursion they went uh, to the east rim of the pit. So we can see here, April 16th, the caption says, HVO geologist surveys the lava lake from the eastern rim of Hale Makumo Crater at the summit of Kilauea. The cliff that covers the top half of the photo formed during the collapse events of 2018 and gives a sense of the scale. Photo Matt Patrick, April 16th. So this is that upper edge right on here, right? So this means that we're down on a down drop block of Kilauea here. So let's let's advance and get a little bit more information. So this is that zoomed in view I showed you guys earlier of that levee on the edge of the lava lake. Here's that North Bay and one of those islets. And the entry point would be, I'm sorry, the west vent and the entry points are all, all over here. So we're going to take this, we're going to zoom out. And as before, that's what fits in right in here. Same image I showed you guys before. So now I'm going to point out, point of view, you can see the little bit of this red rock here on the edge. You see the silver vent, a big one, right below to the right. 
and that's you can see a sulfur along this whole north edge of the crater over here, west vent at the very very far end. So where exactly were these guys? Well, if you look in here's our thermal image once again. So there is that sulfur vent right in there, and here is that closest and cliff. If somewhere in a range of somewhere down in here. It's a range of it where it appears they actually were. Right? So if I zoom it back out, that was right in here on this down drop block. This is all the collapse area. That was a big cliff we're looking at on the background way up here. So from that perspective, all this blue is the cooled crust and the far our bright colors are, are the, the active lava surface at the far end of the lava like there. So they must have helicoptered in. We know, we know that they've been in there to maintain seismic instrumentation before. And uh, now they're uh, doing some fancy surveying over here. Fancy instruments. And if we look a little more detail. Here's our geologic map, and I can use this to, we're talking about some of the cracks and lava coming out, right? This shows the edges of where cracks exist within a crater that allow all these different pieces of land to move cracks all around. Those are the possible lava pathways coming up, and it seems like the, the path was essentially somewhere along this edge along here actually along this edge right in here too high right in here and it's filled in all that lower section right in there so zoom in a little more you can see a little bit of a ridge this is the april 1982 fissure line that cut across caldera floor and a lot of that youngest lava flow is 1982. And some of the oldest stuff is actually down here just below that 1888 1889 just below that uh, the more ripply stuff so I go back to here. Oh. You can see that fresh lava flow. It's darker color in here. 82 flow. And that ridge right in there. Now, one more time back to this photograph. You look behind this guy. Along the crater edge right in here, you see this ridge. Here. There's that spatter rampart, edge of that spatter rampart from the 82 eruption, apparently. Photograph right in there. Right in there at the right side. So, there it is. Uh, let's show you guys this map as well, because this map also shows it in more topography. There is that spatter rampart one more time there. And here is that. The edge where they were looking. So that's why we don't usually get that view, is because it takes someone landing in a helicopter and walking over there to take that photograph. And now there's there's not a whole lot of action on that side anyways, which is no incentive to put, for example, a new webcam or anything like that out there. All our action is still focused west over here. So, but from these maps, this is the most recent map was issued on April 5th, 2021. And it, Every time it has statistics on it right through here. So it'll tell you the surface above sea level, depth, surface to bottom. So this is still one meter shallower than we are currently right now. We actually went up to and dropped one since two or three weeks ago. But there it is. Active lake area, three hectares, eight acres. Total lake area, 44 hectares, 109 acres. And total lake volume, either 39 million cubic meters or 10 million gallons. There. So if you go back and compile all these maps that they've issued, they issued over the course of time, you can get some kind of estimates here. And so I'll show you guys. You can see in red first this volume. It went up very quickly in the first weeks of the eruption, and a little more slowly the next month, a little more slowly the next month. And this last month has been the slowest of all as far as gaining volume. But still gaining volume, lava has to come out continuously. That's that red line. And following that same pattern, Total area in acres here in yellow. 
increased a lot at the beginning and jumped up a couple of times and is now more, mostly plateaued here, right end of our graph. Uh, the active area of the lake, which is the green part, it's a little opposite here, was following that early on, but right after New Year's and those first few days of January, we start, start seeing the change, and by mid-January, we have most of the, the lake surface actually crusted over, and the active surface has been decreasing gradually, more gradually recently over the last two months, but still very slowly in decline. And finally, the question that was asked earlier, as far as the volume rate, if you take those maps, our most recent measurement on a blue line over here is at 0 0.5, dark there, 0 0.5 cubic meters per second. Uh, that is uh, about 20 cubic feet per second or so. And you guys, give you, uh, you guys don't think in metric. So this first month in here, we peaked around 90 cubic meters per second which would be uh, about 3,200 cubic feet per second. That was that early on, that second day, when it really dropped off pretty quickly. But it was higher in that first couple months in there. Right, so that first month, it actually uh, averaged out 10 cubic meters per second over the whole month, whole month average. That second month average was down to 2 cubic meters per second. The next one was 1, and now we're down here waiting for an update to see what this final month might be, but we're seeming to be declining below one. And of course, with only one significant figure and very rough approximations from the maps, it's hard to tell how accurate we're getting now, just to the fact that we're down around an area of one, perhaps less than one here from our calculations. So that's the, that's the trend of it there. And that's why the output rate has been so low and why a lot of interest uh, has turned elsewhere, but uh, will remain true to Kilauea here. and make sure everything is documented as eruption still continues clearing out here at the end. So there's the lake measurements um, and kind of tie it together here. I'll show you guys a few of these time lapses from the last four months altogether. So starting off with a thermal camera here, uh, the whole last four months and it goes by a little quick, but as you can see here that original lake of water, oh, no, I'm in blue, change my color. The lake of water is showing in here, I put the scale on this one, showing it at 80, 90 degrees Celsius from this distance. And this is December 20th. And the scale is going to jump up to 600 Celsius as lava comes in, steams away to Lava Lake, and like a snap of the fingers once I start it. And then fills that whole surface, fills that whole pit, uh, eventually crests over in that back half of the surface. And you also see that island spinning around in there. So we'll see it in all different views here. We'll start off with the F1 camera. Last four months. There it is. North vent dies off. West vents in play. The back half crests over. You can see some of the pulsing of the outflow of lava. And some of the ooze ups around run the perimeter as well. Same view from the KW camera. Zoomed in and cropped. Similar kind of view. Sunset images here retreat of a lava surface back around the island to this smaller area closer to the foreground of the camera. And this is a normal wide view of that camera there. Camera. So a lot of uh, dynamic changes early on in that first month of eruption and Field changes continue occurring, but they're happening at a slower rate uh, each month that we go on here with the laser eruption. Here's a S1 camera, view from the south to north. Daytime view only, nighttime view only. Lava filling up, partway up that west vent cone. And here's a whole panorama showing the whole eastern part rusted over of the lava lake. I mean, the lava is still going underneath all that. And oozing up in the backside here from time to time, all around the whole, whole perimeter of the lava lake, most of which is out of view there. Credits and links. How about Bob Martin collecting all those all those images that we can make our time lapses from? And before we do our our last round of questions here, I do want to feature a couple of local photographers. Oh, let's see if it's going to load for me here. Here we go. Harry Durgan, Dynamo, Artwood Desert. 
So even with slow rates, there's still plenty of interesting stuff going on. The beauty is still amazing. Here's Harry capturing it in Cairo Desert this past week. This photograph's Dynamo. I'm going to show you guys. Let's try to load one more. You can do it. There it is. Harry Durgan. Lady in a red dress, Kilauea from Kau Desert. That same night. Howell Harry, for being to the community enjoyment of the eruption here. And you guys can go on whitetracker.com and find those images. And if not yet, then very soon be able to click a button and buy, buy those images at some point. There are other ones on there as well that you guys can find. Check that out, hawaiitracker.com. Where we also are been have been posting text versions of our updates, and uh, we'll also be putting a short video summary of our live update today, uh, a little later tonight. So, with that, Dane, any more questions come in here in the last few minutes, or? Yeah, and we had uh, one more donation come through uh, from Celeste on uh, whitetracker.com/support. Appreciate that one, oh. and we do have just a couple questions here for you. Not a lot. Get through this nice and quick. Um, Tanya asks, it seems like the pulsating uh, we see now at the Lava Lake is the same at the end of the 2018 eruption. Are the, these related? That's, that's a good question. They were, they, were, they were different without going into too much detail. In 2018, we were saying there was both pulses and surges, right? So the pulses may be relating to that gas outlet where you do see some cyclical variation where you see more outlet and a little bit less and more a little bit less and that might vary on a five or ten or fifteen minute cycle sometimes and probably some of the variation we see in the lava lake graphs and the fine everyday things are that kind of thing happening um the surges not to be confused you know were were being induced by the collapse of the summit and that weight of that all that rock Compressing the magma chamber and sending a pressure wave through the, the magma pipeline. And so that was a little bit different. The surges were a little bit different than what we're seeing now. But the pulsations, perhaps so. Yeah. So good point. We have a 499 super chat from Dangi. He says, they say, um, went up there a few days ago. So maybe a minute of the red glow on the steam and clouds, but then the mist closed in. At the volcano house, still enjoyed the day. Yeah, that happens up there. <laughs> yeah, mahalo for the report. Appreciate the yeah. donation. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for the donation. Yeah, that was one question I had the other day asked to me was, um, can you still see the glow up there with how small the little lava lake is? And I did see a photo from a few days ago, and you can still see it if the conditions are right, and it's still pretty impressive. Like if you haven't seen the glow of a volcano you know it is worth checking out if you're on the island but you know if you're thinking about making a trip here specifically for that might wait a little while um type yeah. of thing there's nowhere on the ground you can get to publicly accessible to see it right although there are some air tours that are occurring and that, that might be one way but check with the, re the re regulations and restrictions as well we also have a ten dollar super chat from jw that asks why no frogs tonight Good question. Uh, days are getting longer. It's it's really hot out, and <laughs> I'm guessing that's it, at least for me. <laughs> They'll be here in about 20 minutes, I bet. Yeah, it is getting it is getting a little uh, longer days now. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, we don't get right. them quite as quite as much here in Hawaii as you do in the mainland or other parts of the world because we're a little more temperate here. Yeah, but um, frogs might be a right. little bit the little clue you guys get to seasonality there. It's now another sign we've been doing this for four months from dead the, of winter you know yeah, they're the one things out here more sensitive to the the one thing out here more sensitive to the temperatures than i am like yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I can't handle the cold or the hot and it seems like they can't either yeah. and um, earthquakes too right it, it, it would all stop chirping before an earthquake yeah. well i'm the opposite on that i don't feel them ever <laughs> <laughs> i'll appreciate jw and uh dangy and we have one more super chat from freeman uh for twenty dollars Says Mahalo for all the shows. Uh, well, thank you guys. Thanks for all the super chats. Freeman. And let's dive back into some questions. Well, I have one from Freeman here. He says, uh, does the rubble under the drop down blocks then become melt and new magma for the system? 
I, so I think that the the rubble under the down drop blocks. Um, so underneath all that collapse from 2018 is what he's talking about, and whether that stuff right. could remelt, right? And 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 possibly it could remelt if you have enough heat coming up, but it's it's you can only melt some fraction of the volume of whatever is coming up. To put it that way, whatever is coming up to provide the heat is really doing most of the work. And the melting of other stuff around it as a small, com smaller component. It can happen to, to a limited degree, but for the most part, it's that new batch that's required to come up that brings up the extra heat to cause it to happen. But then it also brings a magma, which can, is easier to erupt than the other stuff. So it always right. joins the party and gets involved as well, right? So it's, it's never like purely. It's not like a, a static heat source that's just heating it up and it can then melt. It's actually a flow of liquid magma coming through the system that's physically bringing the heat up and closer. Yeah. Right, right. We got one more. We got one here um, from Bill question that says, uh, what does the chemical analysis tell us about the relationship of the current eruption in the in Holly Mau Mau as compared to uh, that coming out of Fisher 8? We only have one early chemistry measurement so far, and that was uh, uh, still all we have to go on. And presumably, if there was some major discovery since then, it would have been announced. So I don't know where I would lean to the side of it. it hasn't changed that much, but I haven't heard anything um, to suggest otherwise. Right. So uh, likely it, it was that same same magma that was stored in a summit uh, in 2018. Uh, in that lava lake that had a chance to degas that did eventually come out of Fisher 8. So th that whole later stage of Fisher 8, especially Ahu Ela'au, uh, that is that pretty much same that same lava coming out, the same chemistry lava. Yeah, so great question, great connection there. Um, Nicholas just asked for clarification on what is a spatter rampart. So uh, spatter is that lava that's coming out and being thrown into the air as a liquid and is landing still liquid. And you might you might think of it as splattering, right? But it's actually spattering is a, uh, another another word that's similar. Um, and as it piles up, all that stuff, all those gobs that land liquid and then harden and then land liquid and harden and makes a pile of them, it builds a, a line, a wall, essentially, right? So when you have a fissure opening up, often you have a, a, a line of this spatter forming. And wherever the fissure is fountaining higher, the stuff builds up higher, taller and taller and taller and taller. And because the cracks are often different segmented cracks, right, one here and one here, you'll have sections where the spatter's higher and then spatter's less, and then spatter's higher and then spatter's less. So you end up having this linear feature with high mounds and lower mounds that looks like the wall of a castle, thus a rampart and thus a spatter rampart. So it's the lava that piles up along the edge of fissures usually while landing still liquid. There is a one question here I just want to say. Uh, Kyle Lana asks about Mauna Loa and earthquakes on there, and we will be doing Mauna Loa on Friday. Um, but as of if you want to just say it or I can say it, not much is changing on Mauna Loa currently. Yeah, there's nothing worth an extra update on Mauna Loa at the, that time. Things can change, but um, it's still doing that off and on and off and on, adjusting for sure, but doing so in fits and spurts. And uh, last one here from uh, YouTube, Victoria asks, uh, is the Kalu Desert where the fog mostly blows? And is that area populated? So during normal trade winds, which we're coming into trade wind season now, or most of the time it's trade winds, uh, it does blow across the Kalu Desert, and then it continues going around the island. It'll go past the uninhabited national park, and then it does reach areas where there is farming and habitation, right? Pahala. Ocean View, South Point area, and often that vog can wrap around the south part of the island and get trapped on an onshore, offshore Kona area. So South Kona especially, but all the way up the Kona coast can have vog collecting depending on the wind conditions. And so until the wind changes and clears it out, you could have you could have a lingering effects more so in farther away areas than near the volcano. In fact, which is which is interesting. And then there's one more effect, which is that the closer you are to the source the uh, the less reaction time, um, the less rea re reaction has occurred between the gas and the atmosphere, the water vapor, and using uh, sunlight. 
Um, and that actually changes the gas into small little particles that makes it that hazy VOG, right? So different, there's different kinds of VOG is what I'm trying to get at. You get that more mature VOG that has more particle rich that lingers longer on a cone of sides farther away, right? So that's, that's the pattern right. here. Well, that basically does it for me on the questions. Uh, appreciate everybody that joined us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And uh, check out hawaiitracker.com for more. Yeah, mahalo, everybody. Mahalo, Dane. I'm Philip Ong. Aloha, everybody.